The wind cuts across the valley, depositing the fine dust in a layer over everything. No matter how often you brush it away, it is omnipresent. Centurion Tip Ulrin scowled and looked down again at the time. Oh, 2.30. It was time. After weeks of playing mouse and eagle, this perfect moment presented itself to crush these rebellious barbarians while they were at camp. Victory would be swift, glorious, and quite possibly enough for a transfer out of the Cohorse Moratory to a more respectable posting. All he had to do was win. Centurion Ulrin took one last breath and pushed the mech's pedals. The 50-ton battle mech that shared its name with his rank began to take its first bold steps toward destiny. After all, dulce et decorum est pro patria mori. The Marian hegemony is a fascinating case study for how the stars can sometimes align for individuals who seek their fame and fortune in the periphery. It also never hurts if you're charming, well-read, and a little bit lucky. For Johann Sebastian O'Reilly, still easier to say than Magistracy of Canopus, the periphery was his home turf and stomping grounds. Having grown up on the edge of civilized space, O'Reilly had heard the tales of Star League technology and supplies hidden and long forgotten, just waiting to be found and converted into fortunes. In 2930, his search paid off in an unexpected way as he landed on the planet named Alphard. He didn't find a Star League cache, but he did find a massive seam of metallic ore that included a very high percentage of germanium. Once refined, germanium was used in electronics across many industries, and as a result, the find was worth many billions of sea bills. O'Reilly was smart and savvy enough to understand that if he made a big stink about his find, he wouldn't live long enough to enjoy it. If there was any chance for him to build the infrastructure needed to process this metal for sale, he had to do two things. The first was hiring enough mercenaries to protect the claim, and the second was to create a colony which would serve the dual purpose of providing housing and essentials for a mining workforce, but also justify their presence on the planet in the first place. If you're simply a little colony trying to make a go of things, there might be fewer questions from predatory individuals who would show up and make their own plans for the minerals. Once the mining operation was set up, the sea bills started to roll in. Being a big fan of ancient Rome, O'Reilly decided to theme his colony on the long-defunct Terran Empire. Bringing in refugees seeking a new start away from the trials and dangers of the Inner Sphere, O'Reilly organized his new colonial society in a way that mimicked the structure of the Roman Republic. Of course, he did modify things so that he would be a permanent imperator instead of an elected consul, but details are often lost in the sands of time. The social classes were split into three groups. The patricians, who were the upper-class folk who showed up to the colony with resources or skills that made him immediately useful to O'Reilly. The plebeians, who made up a bulk of the rest of the colonists. And finally, a group that were slaves. Yep, you heard me right. Near the end of the 30th century, a human being decided it would be a good idea to implement slavery. This is an example of how someone can know just enough history to be dangerous. O'Reilly sought to recreate a system that he thought worked well but he didn't know or didn't care that the system of slavery was a continual problem for the Roman Republic as it perpetually put downward pressure on wages to the point that huge swaths of the plebs were unemployed and on the dole because it was always easier to get and use slaves. It caused a lot of problems for the Republic over time and contributed to the eventual death of the system and a transition to an authoritarian empire. Even if he was willing to ignore the moral and ethical issues of keeping another human being as a slave, an educated fan of Roman history would know not to replicate that aspect of their society. But the slave class consisted of prisoners of war taken during military operations, as it was illegal for a citizen of the hegemony to be forced into it. <sighs> Let's just move on. A lot of time and effort was put into the Roman aesthetic. A visitor to the Marian capital world in 3067 wrote, My second day on the Marian hegemony capital world, and I already feel like an extra in an old flat vid Roman costume drama. Monumental architecture abounds. Triangular topped buildings festooned with columns loom over the streets of Nova Roma. Their gold tinged local sandstone and snowy marble facades glowing in the afternoon sun. The autumn sky is a pale rose, a lighter shade from a magenta glow of high summer. The line of pediment stands out against it in a sharp relief. Later on, as the day moves towards evening, the 
the Latin inscriptions in many of them will be rendered illegible by the creeping dusk. Now, however, a mere hour past midday, many are clearly readable. At first glance, it almost seems like a mixture of cosplay and stolen valor. The Marians have always sought to hit above their weight class, and the adoption of so much of what they saw as quintessentially Roman felt more like a reflection of the inadequacy than it does inspiration. Growth of the Marian hegemony was slow at first as O'Reilly had to play his cards close to his chest concerning the vast wealth in those mines. The mercenaries that were hired to protect the planet from pirates, or anyone who wanted to get too nosy concerning what the colony was up to, ended up themselves becoming pirates and preying on nearby systems. This brought in even more money and resources which aided in the hegemony's growth. Much like with the OG Roman Republic, growth was fed by blood and treasure. The influx of cash paid for infrastructure and the construction and funding of an imperial war college, which was intended to build up the capabilities of the official hegemony military. The Marian hegemony was still small by the Fourth Succession War, so the piracy and raiding antics flew under the radar. The Free Worlds League had much bigger issues at the time. By the 3040s, Marius O'Reilly, Imperator at that moment, was enjoying a long period of success and growth for his hegemony. New planets were being added through colonization and the odd conquest here and there. However, his son Sean would throw a wrench into things by being a lecherous thief, gambler, and collector of expensive mistresses. While he was able to behave like this as the son of the Imperator, his own paranoia started to kick in. Sean was worried that he would be passed over and not inherit the Imperatorship in favor of Sean's six-year-old son, Julius. Eventually, this paranoia led to disaster for Marius, who conveniently died in a climbing accident on the colony world of Herculaneum in 3048. While no one could prove that this accident wasn't really an accident, the rumors of patricide flowed like wine at a summer villa. Sean O'Reilly returned to Alfard, went through all the motions of a grieving son, and moved quickly to secure his power over the hegemony. In a bizarre homage to the death of the ancient Roman Republic, O'Reilly began to reform the government along the lines of the Roman Empire. Laws and social rules took a much more authoritarian turn. Ancient Rome was even referenced as justification as these sometimes very unpopular changes were put into effect. Military funding was expanded, adding another two legions to the first, a legion consisting between 90 and 150 battle mechs or vehicles would be hard to ignore. With new soldiers and an influx of military hardware purchased from across the inner sphere, O'Reilly quelled dissent through implied threats and promises of future riches through conquest. He even started to go by the title Caesar, which is just peak narcissism. The new legionaries needed to be tested, and Caesar O'Reilly picked the nearby fledgling state called the Lothian League. Much less wealthy than the hegemony, the Lothians were unable to replace defense forces and buy the services of mercenaries to protect their planets from the Marian incursions. Eventually, starting in 3054 and lasting a little bit more than a year, the planets of the Lothian League fell to raids, pillaging, and then set up for permanent occupation. Resistance was strong, as tends to be the case on periphery worlds. The Lothians were not willing to roll over and become serfs under the boot of the hegemony. More and more money and lives were being spent trying to hang on to an increasingly unprofitable venture. When word of Blake representatives showed up in 3058, O'Reilly was wooed with promises of cutting-edge technology and battle mechs with which he could expand his empire. Signing a deal with the proverbial devil, the number of hegemony legions expanded to five and new military campaigns were undertaken. Some independent planets fell, though eventually the magistracy of Canopus, backed merchant unit known as the Avantes Angels, hammered the hegemony legion so badly that the expansion efforts stalled. While out campaigning to expand his empire, Sean O'Reilly was not paying attention to what was happening back in the capital. His son, Julius, was now of age to get involved in politics and military affairs. He was assigned to command a century of the first Marian Legion and quickly built connections with his fellow officers and inspired loyalty from his soldiers. Always the paranoid one, Sean saw his son's rising star and began to try and undermine Julius's career by ordering he be transferred to the second Marian Legion which was stationed in the relatively distant Lothian occupation. Out of sight, out of mind, worked as a principal for a while. However, Julius took advantage of his posting by seeking to resolve the ongoing conflict with the Lothian rebels in a manner that would be advantageous to both sides. While he was doing this, Julius was now openly defying his father and denouncing the authoritarian nature of the regime. 
Julius continued to build a power base among the Second Marian Legion, and when a leader of the Lothian resistance movement was captured, he went out of his way to seek a way to end the perpetual meat grinder of an occupation. Julius went so far as to offer widespread concessions in exchange for an end to the attacks from the resistance. He even offered the leader, Dame Lorelai Logan, a position as one of his personal advisors. In less than one year, Julius had secured the unfailing loyalty of the Second Marian Legion and ended the resistance from the Lothian League. When Julius returned to the capital, he did so at the head of the Second and Fourth Legions, as well as a sizable chunk of the Third. Seeing the writing on the wall, elements from other units joined the effort to challenge Sean O'Reilly for control of the hegemony. On Alfard in 3063, Julius marched his forces into the capital city and laid siege to his father in his royal palace. After going through the variety of offenses which highlighted Sean O'Reilly's lifetime of corrupt and deviant behavior, Sean remained defiant. Forces loyal to Sean were cut down and ultimately Julius marched into the palace's throne room to confront his father. Given the opportunity to abdicate his position, Sean instead desperately attacked his own son. On August 8, 3063, Sean O'Reilly was killed by Julius in an act that would sadly be fitting the transfer of power in the later centuries of the original Roman Empire. By the next day, Julius O'Reilly had been anointed the new Caesar by the Senate. Keeping his promise, he enacted reforms that granted the Lothian League and Illyrian Palatinate status as united territories within the hegemony which included representation in the Senate. The citizens of those territories were also granted Marian citizenship along with a three-year exception from conscription. Julius also reformed the government in an attempt to reduce graft, waste, and give Marian citizens more of a voice in how things run. He once again borrowed from the past in the creation of the Plebeian Tribunate which at least created the impression of a more representative government. Even under this new leadership, the hegemony continued to prey upon its neighbors and wage wars of conquest. During the Word of Blake years, the Marian hegemony fought the Circinus Federation, which was acting in concert with the Blakists. During the conflict, Alfard was targeted with a Blakist neutron bomb, which killed the Caesar and caused a leadership crisis as most of the city's population was wiped out. Following the conclusion of that conflict, the Marians focused on rebuilding military strength and consolidating holdings across the hegemony. This included spending on the development of a domestic industrial base for producing weapons and eventually battle mechs, someday. Due to their perpetually aggressive behavior, the Marian hegemony has generally crappy relations with other nearby periphery states. I get the impression that the magistracy of Canopus is just thoroughly annoyed and quite fed up with the long history of piracy and raids on Canopian settlements. In order to keep the supply of germanium flowing, and to act as a counter to the Canopians and the Torians, the Free Worlds League under Thomas Merrick was friendlier with the Marian hegemony than one would expect, as Free Worlds League planets were also subjected to raiding. The Six Legions and the Cohorts Moraturi, which is a unit of questionable training, discipline, and ability to follow orders, have all been rebuilt following the word of Blake's destruction. The hegemony has also actively hired trusted mercenary units to fill in gaps in defense and to free up Marian soldiers for raiding. The Marian military is based heavily on the organization of the legions of ancient Rome. The names are similar, though the numbers may differ a little bit due to the constraints and needs of the 31st and 32nd centuries. The standard soldier's uniform includes a gray tunic over black pants, flexible ballistic plate greaves, and body armor also standard. To complete the Roman look, the Marian helmets look very similar to the Cassus helmets once worn on ancient Terra. All soldiers wear a leather belt, on which is frequently found a short sword called, you got it, a gladius. I'm sure it would be absolutely baffling to someone under attack who didn't already know what the Marians were all about. As we move into the Ill Clan era, it appears that the Marian hegemony is continuing to do what it has always done by raiding and seeking to expand its borders through conquest and colonization. As of 3145 and in the following years, the Third Legio was still garrisoning three former Free Worlds League worlds of Landfall, Huntington, and Hazeldean. From what I was able to find, it looks like the Marian Legios have had a mixture of successes and failures in the 3100s, and having expanded so much in the past few hundred years, more and more of their time and treasure will have to be spent maintaining and hanging on to what they already have, rather than going out on grand expeditions to gobble up new territory. After all, why break with historical tradition? Wrapping all this up with a bow, the Marian hegemony is a bit of an odd duck as far as periphery nations go. Sure, it's kind of neat to have a society built upon an ancient civilization, yet the inexplicable inclusion of elements of that civilization that contributed to its own downfall 
is hard to forgive. It's a bit like a college freshman taking a Roman history survey course and then deciding to take everything they learned in that semester and recreating the Roman civilization. There are lots of good details there, but it's a mile wide and an inch deep as far as really understanding what it would take to apply the Roman template on the 31st and 32nd century galaxy. I think a reasonable argument could be made that the benefits of creating such a singular cultural monolith are lost due to the flaws inherent in the system that they would have known about for 3,000 years. We'll have to wait and see if they have any role to play in this Ilkland era. I wouldn't be shocked if we heard very little about Battletech's most famous miners turned cosplayers turned pirates turned periphery state. We'll see. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed it and want to see more, make sure you use that free action to hit the like and subscribe buttons. Google is still apparently working on getting the channel membership started, so if you want to directly support the channel, Ko-Fi is still the best option. A link is below. Thank you all who are already supporting the channel that way and continue to help bring content like this on a consistent basis. Until we meet again, take care and go make the world a slightly better place today and tomorrow.